there's a beautiful saying that's kind of come out of modern neuroscience that says um, neurons that fire together wire together so perhaps you've heard this before but it basically means that when you have an activity the way that your mind is during that activity the mindset or the, the, the approach that you have in that activity actually becomes set with that activity so if you bring mindfulness or awareness into a certain activity or situation and you consciously practice that then every time you come back into that situation you're, you're creating new neurons you're learning in that situation mindfulness is going to be part of that learning and mindfulness is actually going to be part of the new understanding of that perspective it makes sense it's kind of simple you know if i start to be if i if i take on the practice of of if i take washing dishes for example as a practice where i become mindful of how i'm washing my dishes then after some time a few weeks maybe a few months um the mindfulness becomes automatic i just get up to do that activity and it's automatically mindful it's like become a new habit a mindful habit and you know mindfulness is the key ingredient where for all any type of development there has to be mindfulness there no mindfulness and then development's not really happening it's kind of the active ingredient now when we do that together when we take on activities or the ways of being or the ways of relating and we start to kind of relate in in a way that that puts awareness in the center or mindfulness in the center then also our neurons are starting to our neurons that are firing in that relationship or in that way of relating start to become rewired in a way that's not just with mindfulness but it becomes mutually mindful now mutual a mutual mindfulness is very nice is a very nice resonance to feel that with somebody but then when things become also a little bit conflictual or our boundaries start to rub up against each other that mindfulness doesn't get hijacked well probably gets hijacked but if we take on a lot of practices if we have a consistent practice over a longer period of time then the mindfulness actually becomes part of the way that we relate even in conflict does that make sense that makes sense so I want to just start with a very, very simple exercise that's uh, going to um, demonstrate this. And, and, and we're going to very, you know, it's going to be based on mindfulness. And mindfulness can be presence or can be simple awareness. And um, based on the, the, let's take the Buddhist definition, the, the, the definition of mindfulness from Buddhist psychology. A lot of great definitions of mindfulness, but if we go just back to that kind of basic definition from Buddhist psychology, which is a phenomenological definition. That the characteristic of mindfulness is that it's non-superficial. So what that means, super simplistic what I'm saying, but you know, let's let our neurons rewire this kind of way of looking at mindfulness. This is not to say that it's the only definition. There's many ways to, beautiful ways to define mindfulness or awareness or presence, whatever you want to say. But from the Buddhist psychological point of view, or the point of view of Buddhist psychology, which is a phenomenological definition of mindfulness, um, mindfulness is non-superficial. It means mindfulness doesn't stay on the surface. Uh, you know, the moment it, you activate mindfulness, there's a deepening that happens. Deepening of what? A deepening of knowing what's arising in the present moment. So if I'm, if I'm, paying attention to my body there'll be a deepening of the knowing of what's going on in my body if i'm somehow in, in my emotion or my feeling there'll be a deepening of knowing what's in my emotion and what's in my feelings or what's in my my mind for example if i'm relating with somebody i'm doing a process which we're about to do um there'll be a deepening of that relational process um and mindfulness is the key. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a very simple mindfulness exercise. Uh, with, um, it's a who am I question. It's, it's an inquiry. Yeah. And if you remember mindfulness, it's like, you know, if you take a cork from a bottle, and I've, many of you heard me say this before, but if you throw a cork on the surface of water, it bobs up and down on the surface. And think of our kind of daily social relations. Hi, how's it going? Oh, good. We talk about the weather, talk about the news, talk about this, talk about that. It's good but it's social and it kind of stays on the surface. 
and it's like the cork that stays on the surface of water. If you take a stone, you throw it onto the surface of water, the moment it hits the surface, it sinks, it deepens. There's a deepening that happens. That's what happens when you activate mindfulness. And we're going to do this together. And we're going to do it with a very simple question. The question is, who are you? And in the who are you question, um, Linda, since you jumped in first before, can you, will you, would you model this with me? Great. Okay. We'll just do maybe four or five back and forths. I'm going to ask a question. Linda's going to check in and give an answer. Now the answer can be, the first answer is usually more or less on the surface of things. And then she'll ask me and then I'll reflect and I'll answer. And then I'll ask her again and she'll reflect. And we're just going to go back and forth. And the question is, who are you? And you can do variations of the question, but um, that's basically the question. So Linda, who are you? I'm a mom. Okay. And when you're, in miles, yeah. yeah, and then we'll, we'll just go back and forth like ping pong. Miles, who are you? Uh, I'm a little nervous, agitated from the tech problems before. And Linda, who are you? Um, I'm tired today. And who are you, Miles? Uh, a little vulnerable, shaky from, yeah, from what I just said before. And Linda, who are you? I'm a little uncomfortable as I'm sitting here. Miles, who are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit more accepting in this moment. Yeah. And Linda, who are you? I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening now. Miles, how are you? I'm feeling received. Yep. Great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Super simple exercise. You know, this is it's it's kind of a check-in. Um, and it's based on this idea is that that um uh you know neurons that fire together wire together so how we are together you know if we have a if it's linda and i we could have a political discussion and maybe we agree we don't agree but but we're actually creating structures in the mind relationally as we do that here we're, we're setting up this kind of you know we're putting awareness in the middle and just repeating the question and you know seeing what happens in this uh relational space okay okay so you're all you're all in Great, everybody. Welcome, welcome back. How was that? Uh, how was that exercise for you? Okay. Yeah, we feel like we're we're starting to kind of come together now. Now, in in um, when we talk about spiritual friendships or relationships that organize around um, uh, spirituality, um, we gotta we gotta have a kind of a general uh, what do you say a definition of what is spirituality. And there's so many ways that we could go with this, but I always try to kind of reduce it to its most basic principle. And for me, and certainly what this means in, in um, well, I was going to say Buddhism, but probably every religion or every spiritual tradition, um, spirituality points to fundamentally, if you get down to the, just the most basic, basic bare bones definition, it points to some absolute perspective or ultimate truth or universal principle. That means if it's spiritual here, then over there, it's also spiritual. If it was spiritual 1,000, 2,500 years ago when the Buddha was sitting underneath the Bodhi tree, it's spiritual today. If it's spiritual today, it's going to be spiritual long into the future when the world disappears and all, and, and the human project also disappears, hopefully not too soon. Um, it's still spiritual. Spirituality was, was, was always here. 
it always is here and always will be. Uh, Blaise Pascal, Blaise Pascal uh, had this beautiful space saying about God, the divine, the energy and the intelligence of the universe, spirit, absolute, the divine. He said that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. That is an absolute perspective. We could also say something like unconditional love. Or we could say something like emptiness. And this is where it starts to get paradoxical because even though it's absolute, from different angles or different approaches, the absolute has a different taste. So unconditional love could be one taste, maybe more of a kind of like in Christianity or Jesus was really you know deep into unconditional love and forgiveness. I mean, forgive me, I'm not Christian, but that's kind of my, my take on it. And whereas the Buddha was much more into emptiness and non-duality and other traditions would be more into uh, truth and, and uh, maybe perfection, you know, spiritual perfection, not perfectionism. But whatever the case is, there's an absolute perspective that at the, at the core of everything, it's unshakable, that everything organizes around. You know, the reason a, a religion like Buddhism, for example, like any religion or spiritual tradition, but the reason it's been around for 200,000 2,500 years because it's resting on one of these absolutes, on one of these dhammas, an ultimate reality, and um, and it and therefore it's 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 accessible and it's transmittable and it's um, it, there, there's a there's a unbroken chain in that transmission. When it comes to spiritual friendship, that's kind of that's a quality that comes in a universal principle that if it's the same for me as it was for, for example, the Buddha or Christ or Rumi or whoever, it's the same for you at the deepest level. You and I are very different relative beings, people. And in that relativity, we have a lot of boundaries and you know, those are gonna rub up against each other and bump up against each other. And we'll have challenges and difficulties from time to time. But at the deepest level, unconditional love for me and unconditional love for you, for example, it is the same unconditional love. And that's where you and I and everybody else in this call is one. That's where we are one or, um, or uh, absolute emptiness or absolute oneness. You know, the deepest, deepest, deepest experience of the self. If we can really kind of remove all the layers of the onion until the onion disappears and we fall into the infinite to discover who we are, Whatever was discovered there for me, it's exactly what's discovered there for you. And that's where you and I are one. Um, now, when we come into this duality, yeah, when, 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 when we move out of that oneness into separation, the very first duality, most fundamental duality is self and other or object, subject and object. Hello, friendship. Hello, relationship. That's the beginning of everything. That's the first downstream move from the absolute, if it's all one, if it's all, all undifferentiated universal experience, whatever that is, the moment, the, the next, the, the very first downstream move is, 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 is a duality. And for humans, that duality kind of plays out as subject and object or self and other. And that's where we begin to have relationships and the subject and other is relational is a relational uh, experience. Whether I'm relating with or whether I'm relating against or not with or avoiding, it's a relational experience. And one of the key um, uh, relational qualities that you find in, in, in Sangha, in spiritual community, is the, a, another duality of autonomy and communion that um, when we drop into our deepest sense of self, it, it tends to be autonomous. Autonomous meaning, that it is uh, self-ruled, that, that I exist, who I am at the deepest level exists without rules from the outside. Not because I'm American, not because I'm a man, not because I'm a father, not because I'm 58 years old, not because of my past, not because I do this, this is my profession, not because of that, not because my father was like that, my mother's like this, not because of my children, my wife, it's not because of any of those things. All of those things are fine and dandy. But when we drop into the deepest sense of self, who we are exists in and of itself autonomously. And that is super, super awesome. 
Why is that? <laughs> why is that so great? Because from there, we can fully relate, and we can enter into communion. And these are the two qualities. You know, we 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 you know, as we move into that subject and object, we move into the, the this kind of spiritual relationship of autonomy and communion. The more that I can actually be in my deepest autonomy, the more available I am to deeply commune with another person, to deeply meet another person. And this is kind of the ideal of, uh, of um, you know, spiritual friendship. And from that place, even if I've known you or it's a friend or a, 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 somebody, an acquaintance that I've known for 30 years, I'm not relating to them through 30 years of history, which is usually what we do. You know, I know Audrey for maybe a year and a half, something like that. So, okay, we relate through, you know, we've had a lot of relations online. We haven't met in person yet, but we have a lot of, you know, so often it's like, oh yeah, that's Audrey. Let me talk to her about these things, da, 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 da. So there's kind of a historical relating and there's nothing wrong with that. But then there's also times where we just, that, that goes to the side and then we just meet, you know, we go into these, this type of neurons that wire together, fire together. Who are you in this moment? Who are you in this moment? And that's, um, that is always the experience of this kind of in the moment relating. It has the, it has the quality and the taste of novelty that this is happening for the first time. So these are just all the stuff I'm saying are some qualities of spiritual friendship. And, you know, we want to have, my God, you know, if you think back to some practice that you've had for maybe some years or decades, even the people that you've met along that, those, those, those years of practice um, are, are deeply bonded with, you know, I have friends that I did I keto with in Japan 20 years ago. 25 years ago, even, and I barely see them these days, but, you know, because it was such a developmental period in my life, I was a young man, and was going through this really intense training in a new kind of culture, so it was all new, it wasn't like I was in Texas, um, because of that, we went through an intense growing experience together, and then we go, go went off in our lives, and, but when I meet, you know, for example, some of you know my friend Patrick, He's another Aikido teacher. When we meet, we're just like, we drop right back into the closest brotherhood that we have because, you know, it's there. And we relate, you know, historically. And he happens to be the same age. He also happens to be American. We went to, we lived in different parts of the country, but we graduated high school. So we have the same jokes and the same cultural we meet with all these relative things. And that's fun. We also struggle with some of our old issues from time to time. But both Patrick and I have the ability to drop that all drop all of that in and, and enter into the heart cave together and just from autonomy we commune deeply and what's interesting about that is that novelty allows the the relationship to be redefined moment by moment by moment by moment by moment which is also one of the qualities of spirituality that it is an emergent principle of novelty that is it's not it's never it's not it's not that it's it's not that it's not fixed. The fact is it's never fixed. It is never fixed. The moment, the, the unfolding, the, the experience of the unfolding now is never fixed. And yet our tendency is to say, oh yeah, I know, I know what happened there and that's all fine. But when we enter into that together with another person, we actually enter into this, uh, this place where um, the, the spiritual friendship is actually an emergent, creative co-creative process sound good it's really cool especially when you know when when it's a little bit more conflictual but in order to taste this in order to enter into that we have to kind of become aware not just of who i am but what hijacks who i am in the moment and that's going to be the next uh, the next practice that, that we're going to do we're going to look at what are the potential um, uh, hijackings that we can have in any type of relationship. And the more intimate, like the, the closer that we become with people, the more that we can become hijacked because it, you know, it presses up against our ego structures in a much deeper way. You know, if, if it's a, if it's a loving relationship and the love is there, then, you know, we can go through a lot together. 
<clears throat> but there was a, um, oh, I'm sure many of you heard me tell this story before, but there was a, uh, a story of a um, reporter was going around to monasteries and interviewing monks all around the world, you know, about the spiritual life. And um, he went to this one Christian monastery in Europe somewhere, he went to the senior monk who'd been in the monastery among the, the brotherhood for decades already. And he asked him a simple question, you know, what is the one thing that, that comes between you and communion with God? And without hesitation, he said, the other monks and, you know, our spiritual brothers and sisters are actually, you know, because we're really in that intense experience together, they, that's, that can become the, 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 you know, instead of the resonance that we were all talking about before about spiritual friendship, it can also become the, 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 um, the activating agent for some deep stuff to come up. And they compare uh, these types of friendships to, um, you know, like a bunch of stones in a pouch on the, on the belt or the waist of a monk. Yeah. So the monk had a pouch and let's imagine that the pouch is full of stones and this monk or nun is carrying around this pouch for decades, years and years and years and years and years and years, and years until at the end of his life or at the end of her life, she opens up the bag and pulls out the stones and they've all been beautifully polished into gems because they're rubbing up against each other and they're contained and they're just going again and again, you know, that walking around clicking and clacking and rubbing and, and roughing up each other until at the end, that friction held in a right container becomes the polish to, you know, create a, a bag full of gems. But in order to that, we have to be aware of our, of our triggers, of our hijacks, of our emotional hijack or our amygdala hijack. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to look at now. In fact, let's do a quick, let's just do a quick meditation. We'll do a five minute meditation. I'll guide the first couple of minutes. And then Audrey, if you can set up the rooms for pairs for new groups in twos. And, um, and we're going to look at this. So, so why don't we just find a comfortable position? And we're going to uh, we're going to practice together. Remember, neurons that wire together. So your neurons that fire together wire together. So if we practice meditation together, it actually kind of creates a collective, deeper state. And um, as you're sitting, just turn in. You can close your eyes if you like to keep them open. It's completely fine. And we're just going to stick with the basic practice of mindfulness as our activating agent or as the deepening process. And just check in with your body with no intention to change or manipulate what's going on in the body, no agenda. Just be a mindful of what's arising. Being mindful of the physical sensations that come to the mind. You don't even have to go look for them. They just arise to the mind. And now shifting your mindfulness to the breath. Letting the breath be an anchor for the here and now. And be mindful of the physical sensations. We'll get a little bit more detailed. Being mindful of the physical sensations in the body as you breathe in. And being mindful of the physical sensations in the body as you breathe out. And linking this moment of mindfulness to this moment of mindfulness to this moment of mindfulness, creating an unbroken chain of mindfulness. And now reflecting for a moment on the quality of the mind, the condition or the state of the mind right now. No agenda to change or manipulate what's going on. If the mind is busy having a monologue or dialogue, then just be mindful of that. If the mind is relaxed or open or contracted or in the past or the future, again, it doesn't matter. Just knowing the state of the mind and knowing that as you differentiate and observe the mind with mindfulness, 
the seat of observation is actually in the present moment, in the here and now. From this place of resting, we're going to shift from mindful observation into a few moments of reflection. Reflecting on what triggers an emotional hijack, what triggers an amygdala hijack. And more specifically, you know, what are the things that kind of trigger hijack in your mind, body, nervous system in relationships? When he says these things or when she does those things, it kind of triggers me. That person annoys me or I get offended or whatever the case may be. Again, no judgment. God bless us all. You know, we all have potential triggers. We all potentially can get hijacked into a fight, flight, freeze response or reactions. Just what are the triggers? What are the things that can emotionally, mentally hijack you? And returning to the breath, observing the in-breath and the out-breath for a few more moments. And feeling the space on the inside. As you slowly open your eyes, feeling the space on the outside. Okay. So we're going to go back to our uh, breakout and we're going to do another inquiry. And we're going to do a repeated, uh, repeated sentence, a uh, sentence completion exercise. So the sentence is, um, I can potentially get hijacked when blank. Okay, very simple. All right, I, I get emotionally hijacked, I get mentally hijacked, hi, amygdala, whatever you want to say. I get triggered. It doesn't really matter which sentence is you, but I can potentially get hijacked when blank. Now, there's two ways to give this answer, the blank. Uh, one way is through reflecting. Oh, yeah, when my wife says this, or uh, when I go shopping and nobody's respecting the, 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 the distance, social distancing, you know, or, or when I see a news and, you know, oh, my God, there's more gloom and doom in the news, you know, it hijacks me. So that's kind of reflecting back. That's totally fine. Or you might even find in the moment, in the moment, it's like, wow, well, as I start to kind of feel into this, it's even hijacking me now. Or if you're getting more and more, you feel like there's a more intimacy coming in the relationship. It's like, yeah, I get hijacked when, when things get too close with another person. You know, what, whatever's going on. So you can, you can answer reflectively or you can act, answer like in a process in the moment. And either way is totally fine. But just we're kind of, we're, we're learning about ourselves and we're learning about the other person as we go through this process. Is that clear? Great. So welcome back. Um, so that was interesting. And, and as I said, there were some people here in the main room that were doing the process as well. And, it was, and, and I was kind of an observer. Um, I, I went and got some water and I overheard and then I was kind of observing. And what, I just want to, I'd like to check with any of you because it, it was interesting what I, what I was feeling as I was observing. Um, there were four participants kind of going through what triggers them. Um, did anybody feel in any way a, a trigger come up in yourself or, or when you were listening to another person? Yeah, so, and, and you know, again, it's total observation. So maybe we're here, oh yeah, this person, they get triggered by that. This one, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. It's like, oh, that one, I know. Oh, I know that one. Yeah, you know, and, so, so that's, just, so just being in this space 
where we can not only share, but receive and even feel how this process, just by talking with some objectivity about our triggers, can also be triggers or also activate something. And um, in this process, hopefully, it's being held in a space of awareness. And that really is the key um, that we that we have processes and practices and intentional meetings with others where we can develop this container of awareness, this container of awareness that allows us to, um, to be with what's going on in another person. This container of awareness where another person is allowed to be with what's going on in me. And, um, and, you know, it can be intense. Sometimes it can be difficult and we can easily get triggered. The moment we get triggered or hijacked, that container collapses. It might be a collapse on one side. It might collapse on the other side. It probably, we get into this kind of healthy, unhealthy dynamic of triggers where it just stays in collapse and we're unable to connect and meet uh, anymore. Uh, and that's kind of what we're working on is, is, is in one sense, before we can really can commune with another person, there must be a certain container of awareness that we can actually contain when all the internal bells and whistles are going off, not to suppress those bells and whistles, but to contain them and maybe even share, you know, wow, this is what's going on for me. Oh, that's interesting. What's going on for you? Um, so um, I want, that's what I want to kind of move into and, and, and look at. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe I can hear from maybe one or two people. How was this last exercise for you? Yeah, Morad? For me, the, thank you for this exercise because it was both enlightening and surprising. Uh, surprising because statistically, uh, I would have expected to hear one thing or another of a trigger that I might not be able to relate to. And that just didn't take place. Everything <laughs> we heard, all four of us. It was all relatable. It, 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 was, it was totally relatable. Yeah. And, and it was like a prism. You know, the prism breaks mm -hmm. up the light into all the different colors. That's great. And I got myself really kind of, uh, how shall I say, taken on a journey to look at all the different colors and, 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 and how these triggers come to us. So it was very uh, instructional for me. So I'm That's grateful. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mola. It's like, it's like you know, it, we're all relative beings and our, our triggers or hijacks are kind of going to be relative. But at the bottom, we're all human. It's all, you know, you go back to the, you know, the first noble truth of Buddhism, Dukkha Secha, unsatisfactoriness success, uh, unsatisfactoriness exists. Right. It's a truth. It's a fact. It's not here all the time. It's coming and it's going, but, but even if it goes, it's coming back sooner or later, usually sooner. So that's kind of, um, let me just close some mics here. Uh, that's a fact. And we want to have a, 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 in a way, a, a, um, an appropriate relationship to unsatisfaction, to dissatisfaction. You know, one of the uh, uh, qualities of, uh, well, the Buddha used to talk about spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mita, in terms of teachers. You know, teachers aren't, I mean, there's, there is a hierarchy with, uh, in most Asian Buddhist cultures, it's very hierarchical. But the teacher was often referred to as a spiritual friend. And the spiritual friend had five qualities. And the first quality was that they're lovable. So even as we listen to everybody sharing and we listen to everybody's characters, you know, like Murad was saying that it's just something I can relate to. And, and you know, when, when we can relate authentically to somebody, it's just, yeah, I get you. You know, there's something that's lovable about, you know, another person, even a difficult person. For example, you know, I had that person that we are, we're kind of like oil and water, but we're still in this kind of spiritual relationship. We're still in the same community, the same sangha. Because there's something fundamentally that I that I get about that person, yeah. So there's something that's lovable in spiritual friendship. That's quality number one. Quality number two is that they're worthy of that love. You know, you and I may be hijacked all over the place and you know, different disagreements, whatever. But that one place where we're actually lovable, it's it's respected, and there's a certain trust that we create uh, through that uh, spiritual friendship. That there's a trust that makes it worthy to love or worthy to keep that person 
you know, in the hard space, that they don't really ethically cross lines or, or certainly not intentionally if they do. Another quality of spiritual friend is uh, that they are um, deeply experienced in, um, in practice and, and maybe even some theory, you know, some understanding of the practice. And, and of course, to say somebody's deeply experienced, that's very relative, you know, more or less, but there's a certain depth that we can meet at. And that's, that's, that's another quality of a spiritual friend that it doesn't always stay on the surface. Not that there's anything wrong with superficial or social relationships. They're just more, they're at a different bandwidth and that's fine, totally cool. You know, we want to sometimes, not all the time, but we want to sometimes to be able to drop into something a little bit more relevant, a little bit more authentic. And that's that's the depth part. That's why the, the quality of a spiritual friend is that, according to the Buddha, quality of a spiritual friend is that they, they can go deep with experience. Another quality of a spiritual uh, friend is that they can face hard truths. That when, when there's something that, you know, usually we, we would prefer to avoid because it's uncomfortable. Through skillful means, not by being rude or, or um, invasive or disrespectful, but through skillful means, we're actually able to, con to, to confront it. Or we're, 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 we're connected enough to realize when, it's, when, when the person that we're with, it's appropriate to connect with them in a certain way. You know, we don't force our opinions or force our perspectives on anybody that we're able to kind of be present, be available. And if the other person's uh, uh, also available, we can, we can actually open a difficult issue, confront a hard truth and, uh, and, and process and see what happens. And the fifth and final quality of a spiritual friend, according to the Buddha, is that um, we're friends for the benefit of each other. So I don't make friends with, uh, with you because for my benefit, you know, yeah, so I can get more fame or more whatever, whatever fame or fortune or, or whatever, or some favors or something one way or another. Uh, that's, not, that's to benefit me that we're friends first because we just love to be friends, but it's actually we benefit each other in the spiritual friendship. So these are kind of classic Buddhist ways of looking at um, a spiritual friend, not for our own benefit, even though we, we do benefit from such a relationship. We get a lot of benefits, but we're there to benefit the other person. So kind of holding that, you know, that we're, we are, we're here today of course, for ourselves, but also for the others. Let's just sit quietly for a moment and, and uh, <clears throat> this time instead of checking in with the body, let's go into the heart, the heart space. One of my teachers, you know, refers to keeping the other person in the heart cave, even when, you know, there's something that can be um, worthy of criticism you know why did that person say that or this or that we still kind of make that discernment but we keep them in the heart cave we don't cast them out we draw a bigger circle and we bring them in And at the deepest level, the heart space in me and the heart space in you is the same heart space. And from this heart space, we can go ahead and open our eyes and we will go into a breakout, but we're going to do again a, um, a repeated question exercise. So not free discussion yet. Uh, the repeated, uh, sorry, the, the sentence completion exercise, excuse me. Um, you know, I just gave the five qualities of a spiritual friend from the Buddha. So let's just drop in. Uh, to something a bit more personal. 
And the sentence is, for me, spiritual friendship is blank. In the blank, give a two, three word answer, one, two, three words around that, then let your friend go. And then when they finish, when it's your turn. And again, if nothing's coming up for you, if you do a couple of rounds, you feel like, well, that's kind of it. Just hold the space, just be there. Okay, well, for me, and then as long as it takes, if something comes up, and usually something new will emerge. For me, uh, spiritual friendship is blank. Okay? Like five minutes, five minutes for this one. And, uh, okay, how's everybody doing? How was that? How was that? Um, how was that exercise for you? Okay, for it me, is. this exercise modeled the process of spiritual. The yeah, the process of the exercise modeled the process of spiritual friendship. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. I, I think so too. That's great. Uh, would anybody else like to share? How was that for you, uh, Judith? And then Susan, Susie. Uh, it was what my partner said. Spiritual friendship takes courage. Yeah, nice, nice. Yes. An incredible challenge. Thank you. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Because you know the spiritual practice, walking a spiritual path, whatever that may be. Oh my God! It takes heroic courage <laughs> at times. Sometimes we're on nice plateaus and we sail along beautifully, but other times, you know, there, there's some rough climbs and some deep, dark, you know, valleys of death that we have to pass through. And, and nothing but courage will take us through that. So that's beautiful, Judith. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Susanna, not Susie. Susanna. Um. In front of a spiritual friend, I do not have to pretend to show off or to to play something, play a role. Um, this little moment of trust and being myself, I find out how I really am because I'm not just talking about how rich I am or those things. And then I know myself better and can stay, continue to be myself in other contexts too. And this is for me one of the great gifts of this um, communitary space of trust or spiritual friendship, the spiritual dimension of authenticity. Maybe <laughs> try to pronounce it right. So you can yeah. be authentically yourself yeah. and you know yourself better and Wonderful. continue to be yourself. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Her Henrietta, how about you? You're usually, how was it for you? I'd be curious, to, uh, Harriet, excuse me, Harriet, I'd be curious to hear. Uh, it was excellent. I mean, it was very uh, close. It, it brought us closer together and it made us more intimate. And um, it was like we were we were taking steps alternately up some uh, some cliff or, or, or some staircase whereby we were leading each other to the next step. Mm. Oof. Cool. Yeah, beautiful. You know, it, it kind of reminds me that, you know, I think somebody said before, and this is one of my um, let's say, I don't know, aspects for me of, of spiritual uh, friendship is that we have a, a shared goal, a common goal, even if it's just to be mindful or it could be something to be enlightened or to just to, you know, it doesn't really matter. It can be the profound or profane. It doesn't matter. But um, that's one that we have a shared goal. But, but I think what Harriet, Henry, uh, sorry, what Harriet's pointing to is that we have a shared process. And that process is kind of leading us to where, who knows where it's leading us, but we just know that it's leading us towards more whole, wholeness in a way and more uh, expansion. This is beautiful. Uh, if, if, if there's anybody else who hasn't shared yet, um, we, we went over the desired time just because of the glitch that I had in the beginning of the call today, but we are going to start to wrap it up. But I would love to hear from one or two more if, uh, 
love to hear a man's voice if um you know somebody wants to share uh let's go to Gerlinda. yeah um maybe i'm repeating a little bit what um, harriet said before it it makes a very strong process in myself the more i listen or the more i speak it out it's not so much about the words it is much more about the openness that uh, that um occur or um no uh, yeah what happens inside it's um the more i i listen to the spoken words of of the other person and the more i say there is really a moment of um there is no thought it's 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 just i'm just connected with me and the other and it's the same it, it also began already in this first um, practice when we said this, you know, who are you? And the more you say it, and the more you answer, it's, it's, it's melting together somehow. Yeah. And this is absolutely, it's not overwhelming in the negative thing, but it's, it's really, um, Oh, it's 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 difficult in English to say, but it's it's you know it's it's cleaning away all thoughts or um, it's making very pure. Mm. We we should do this more often with people, or you know this this is a in, very intense practice, I think. And I also connect uh, with my spirit with my spiritual friend inside me. In in that moment when I connect. He, can you understand what I mean, or is, is this totally strange? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> okay, but it's it's absolutely great. Thank you so much. It's awesome, really. Wow, no words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gerlinda. Yeah, there's kind of a coming home in a way, you know, within ourselves, and then also with uh, with with another person. Um, any men? want to share i mean we heard from a lot earlier but how about daniel or or bob or steve or david or paulus paulius i'm happy to hold the men's corner but uh you know i could use some of my brothers in here i can yeah, chime david. in yeah um you know, I too love these these processes, these STEM questions that just go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I haven't, haven't done one in a while, but it's a good good reminder. But this particular one, um, it really helped anchor within me what kind of relationships I want to help cultivate um, in my life as I go down in my particular spiritual path, and and invite people to consciously create this type of of spiritual friendship together um, and to be able to now have some specific qualities and aspects and, and things that we can do together within that and commitments to each other. And so I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank you, David, beautiful. And, and you know, I, I guess based, with, based on that, I guess I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up unless somebody else really wants to share something. Um, I love what you pointed to, David, you know, the, the, these are the type of li uh, relationships that we want to cultivate in our life. And um, because they're relevant, they're really important. And um, like Gerlinda was saying, we get to the relevant very quick. Even if it's a simple, you know, inquiry, like, who am I? Well, what is spiritual friendship to you? We just get to what's relevant, you know. There might be some fun, jokey stuff on top, you know, this and that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm Jewish on my mother's side or my father's, side, whatever. It could be like a you know fun stuff that we say, but then it, it, it pretty quickly it gets relevant. You know, it gets relevant and relevant, not heavy, not serious, but just relevant. And um, and that's for me, that's always been the taste of spiritual friendship. And, and even if it's somebody who's not necessarily spiritual, we're just hanging out and we have the same interests. We just get down to what's really relevant and, and we can, we can really go deep and explore there together in, in a mutual way. And um, yeah, they are important. Having said that, I think it's also important to, um, to remind ourselves that we can never, um, 
it just, we can't force depth of consciousness on another person. So, you know, there's always a good reminder that, you know, we want it, like David was beautifully saying, if we're available, then perhaps others will meet us there. And if other people are ready to meet us there, then it's like, we're just going to meet a, you know, a, a kindred spirit right away. Um, but should other people not be uh, available for that? Then that's okay. That has to be fine. You know, and we just stay available and, and meet people where they're at. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the, the key orientations in my work, and I probably with, you know, I know there's some therapists here on this call and people that work with other people in some type of developmental processes, you know, we meet people where they're at. And then, you know, with the grace of God, we don't leave them where they're at, or they don't leave us where we're at, you know, that, that something can, can unfold in that meeting that's a little bit deeper, a little bit broader, a little bit more authentic, like um, Susanna was saying. Why don't we spend the last, uh, um, uh, let's say, 30 seconds together just sitting in silence, and then I'll make a couple of announcements here at the end. Okay, so um, yeah, I will kind of give a dedication here at the end, but before doing so, uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining. And um, you know, this is um, this was one of our off weeks for our meditation discovery cycle, and um, you know, I periodically do these open open community calls or workshops to actually you know invite people to join us in our meditation discovery cycle. It's it's kind of my meditation program uh as our membership program or uh, it's a, the community that we have and we meet twice a week twice a month on sundays at this time uh to meditate and practice together and usually go through some interesting uh cycle of discovery right now we're actually working on the hero's journey we've moved through several phases of the hero's journey we're in the the phase of spiritual allies mentors uh teachers and friends that you meet on the inner path of practice so that's why the theme of this week this month's workshop is actually uh you know about spiritual friendship because it's related to what we're doing in the meditation discovery cycle um if anybody's interested in joining that it's really a it's it's, it's kind of a cool program and you know i send out i send you like a practice video every month uh, every week we meet twice a month once a month we have a, a question and answer and um it's relatively financially pretty you know it's like a dollar a day to to, to join it so um you guys uh would be very happy for anybody who wants to join us several people in this group already are are in that in that uh, membership program and um i'll send some information when i send out the replay in a, in a day or two i'll send some information about that otherwise if you want to go and look at um look at it now it's on the integraldojo.com you can find uh the trainings and it's the meditation discovery cycle um, and with that, um, you know, um, it's quite common in, in meditation after you know, practices and talks and um, workshops to give a dedication, you know, for <clears throat> for whatever merit. Because practices like this are, you know, they're more common these days. But in, in all of humanity, it's kind of rare when people do this. And it's very special. And there is some, you know, the benefit that we gained is going to be multiplied um, as you turn off zoom and go into your daily life probably with the very next person you meet 
whether they know it or not they're going to get some they're going to get some contact buzz from you you know from from this practice and maybe whatever your whatever state you're going to you know we've cultivated in this 90 minutes together uh, maybe that fragrance will will sustain for some time afterwards so with that i want to wish you um uh, that you you deepen your own understanding of spiritual friendship and that you you um connect with him and um uh, open to uh, more spiritual friends in your life and uh may they be loving lovable friends may they be worthy of the love may they um, be available for depth and um, even if it means opening a, a difficult issue and may you uh, relate and gather together not just for your benefit but for the other benefit the other's benefit and especially for the benefit of the whole and may that lead you forward in your practice forever and always forward on the path of spiritual friendship thank you very much everybody have a wonderful day <laughs>